everything set now, the gun crew moves back to take positions in slip trenches during firing. This is the apex of destructive power for a single artillery piece. The United States 280 mm howitzer Atomic Annie was first tested at the Nevada test site on May the 25th, 1953. It fired a 365 kilogram fission warhead 10,000 meters and it detonated 160 meters above the ground. The yield, 15 kilotons. The Soviet Union also had a stockpile of nuclear artillery shells of a greater yield. Both sides have since decommissioned these tactical weapon systems. Artillery has a long and diverse lineage going back through time to the dawn of gunpowder. January the 28th, 1132. Song Dynasty General Hang Shizong used bamboo cannon to capture the city of Fujian and qualified to be the first recorded user of artillery cannon in battle. The effectiveness of gunpowder and cannon was so great that its technology expanded rapidly throughout Asia and 13th century Europe. Instead of bamboo, lead or cast iron was used. They fired lead shot, iron or stone balls, or sometimes arrows or scrap metal. The earliest of bombards, however, were defensive. Defensive siege cannon were immobile and fixed in their emplacements. These were massive smooth bore weapons constructed from metal rods bound together with hoops like a wine barrel, giving their name to the gun barrel. The cannon rapidly became the armament of choice on land and sea. Naval power was often determined by the number of cannon that could be brought to bear in a broadside assault. There are three main types of cannon or artillery pieces. The mortar is a muzzle-loading device that fires projectiles or rounds on an angle greater than 45 degrees. This enables them to strike targets at higher altitudes or above the firing emplacement and at extreme angles. Second is the howitzer, from the German word Haufen, or heap, which usually describes a short-barreled artillery piece on wheels that can fire projectiles at angles greater than a cannon and less than a mortar. The howitzer is the most common form of artillery piece today. And third, the field gun or cannon. It normally has a longer barrel than a howitzer and a lower angle of projection, usually line of sight. The larger types were often fixed in emplacements to guard coastlines or strategic points. They can also be self-propelled, often resembling a tank, but utilized in a completely different way. The mortar derives its name from the apothecary's mortar, which the original strongly resembled. The mortar was a large and heavy bowl made from iron that was loaded with gunpowder and a heavy projectile and fired by use of a hot iron through a vent hole in the side, much like a cannon. The first use of mortars was as defensive fixed emplacements behind castle walls on battlements. Their high angle of fire allowed them to lob projectiles over high walls, but close in, defending the battlement approaches. Early mortars were heavy and very difficult to move. One Baron Menno van Kohorn developed a portable mortar that weighed around 82 kilograms, which could easily be moved and provide offensive firepower against fixed emplacements, particularly in 1673 at the Siege of Grave. Extensive use of portable mortars occurred during the American Civil War. 
The Union Army employed them defensively to protect railheads and their fragile supply lines. The Russo-Japanese War also saw use of the mortar. This was the first modern war to see the extensive use of trenches. And from that early time, the usefulness of the mortar to attack trenches was seen. Leonid Gobiato and General Roman Kondratenko designed the first mortar to fire a navy shell. By the time of the First World War, smaller one-man mortars had been designed. Again, because of their high angle of fire, they could penetrate deep trenches that conventional artillery could not. Sir Wilfred Stokes invented his Stokes mortar in 1915. It was one person, portable, and easy to use. The Germans also developed a series of trench mortars or Minenwerfer. These were rifled mortars with a much lower rate of fire. There are two ways to stabilize the mortar round in flight. With fins at the base of the projectile or by spinning the round like a rifle bullet. Both have their advantages, but the thin stabilized smooth bore mortar is by far the more common. The modern mortar usually consists of three main parts, the barrel, base plate, and a bipod. Calibers of 60 millimeters to 120 millimeters are common, and most operate the same way. The mortar is placed in position and adjusted for target, then the mortar round is prepared. Each one has a preset amount of propellant in its base. These are augmented by additional amounts of propellant attached to the base. Depending on the range of the target, the more propellant, the further they can fly. The round is then armed and dropped into the muzzle of the barrel. The round slides down and strikes a fixed firing pin at the base of the tube. The propellant is ignited and the expanding gases force the round out of the tube at high speed. Larger versions can be electrically operated or may have a firing pin system similar to an artillery piece. There is also the spigot mortar variant. Once again, these are smaller and easily portable. The projectile fits over the solid rod or spigot. Inside the round is the propellant charge that is fired by a built-in trigger mechanism. These are generally quieter to operate than a standard mortar and simpler to manufacture. However, the specialized spigot mortar ammunition is heavier and slightly less effective. Currently, they are not in favor in most arsenals. One example of the silent mortar is the Belgium Fly K spigot, since adopted by the French as the TN8111. Other types and shapes of projectiles were used, including these plum puddings from the trenches of World War I. As with all weapon systems, someone has to build the biggest. Three monster mortars were developed with a caliber of 910 millimeters or 36 inches. Henri-Joseph Péchance built his in 1832. Mallet's mortar was built in London in 1857 and Little David was built in the USA during the Second World War. Only the monster mortar of Béchance saw service at the Battle of Antwerp in 1832. Modern mortars come in a variety of sizes, from the British 51mm light mortar, which has only a barrel and base plate and is manually adjusted for angle, to the French standard 81mm mortar. A larger version is the Soviet 2S4 M1975 Tulpan, a 240mm self-propelled mortar. Mortars can fire a variety of munitions, from high explosive, smoke or illuminating, including infrared and gas. 
During the First World War, mortars were used extensively to deploy poison gas in an attempt to clear enemy trenches. These mortars were often simple devices placed in trenches, aligned, and then buried to secure them. A small propellant charge and electric detonator were placed in the mortar, then a pressurized canister or bottle of the gas weapon loaded. The rank of mortars would then be fired electrically from some safe distance. The gas would be lobbed through the air into the enemy emplacements and dispersed. Because of the heavier-than-air nature of mustard gas, it would remain close to the ground, in particular in the trenches, where its lethal effects would linger for a long period of time. Not all nations have signed agreements banning the use of such weapons. Cannon and handgun, or arabesque, were used in small numbers through to the 15th century, where experience with the new technology began to turn the tide of conventional battles. The technology of metalwork improved along with the manufacture of cannon. Reduction in the size of barrels was accomplished along with the integration of trunnions, which projected from the sides of the cast barrel to allow attachment to a carriage. During the second half of the Hundred Years' War, artillery began to take effect. Battle commanders were learning how to use artillery effectively. Henry V at the Siege of Arfleur is an example. When his tunneling efforts failed to bring the walls down, he focused his cannon onto one wall flanking the gate. They had ten cannon, three of exceptional size. One was called London, another the King's Daughter. They were fired day and night for 27 days. Slowly, they demolished the castle wall until a breach was made, at which point an incendiary round was fired into the exposed woodwork, and shortly after, the breach was stormed and the town taken. The French caught on quickly, and towards the end of the war became a superior artillery army. Frenchman Jean Bureau became the first great artilleryman. In 1449, he and his brother conducted 60 successful siege operations, utilizing 250 cannon. His crossfire and enfilade with his field artillery caused heavy casualties amongst the English. The next innovative name was John Ziska, a Hussite from Bohemia. Leading an uprising, he and his 400 followers, together with 12 wagons carrying cannon, were able to defeat a much larger cavalry force. From there, the Catholic Church declared a crusade against him. A great thinker, Ziska had his cannon mounted to fire from the wagons and grouped them in a large circle on a hilltop, a very successful use of field artillery. With this technique, they were victorious in many battles. The war raged till 1436, when terms were agreed to by Rome. James II of the Scots was a keen advocate of artillery, which he utilized in the siege of Roxburgh in 1460. Unfortunately, he was standing too close to one artillery piece that exploded, killing him on the field. The development of the cartridge of shot and powder in a bag happened around 1620 and was readily adopted, and with it, the worm, a corkscrew-type tool to clear the barrel after each firing to extract unburnt cartridge bag. Another general, Gustavus Adolphus, is credited with developing the use of cannon in the battlefield to suppress cavalry. He combined musketeers and pikemen as the gunner's force protection. They were an effective fighting force. Larger numbers of cannon combined to create an effective field of fire. However, the battle always depended on the infantry. As a historical footnote, the combination of musketeer and pikeman became a military axiom. Even today, assault rifles have bayonet attachments. Charles VIII of France invaded Italy in 1494. He was a keen disciple of artillery. 
technology of the day had allowed cannon to be cast in bronze. Lightweight and drawn by horses, they could keep up with the main body of an army on the march. By 1550, there were numerous sized cannon as there was no standardization. The English had 16 sizes, from the Cannon Royal at four tons and firing a 75 pound shot, to the smallest Rabiner at 300 pounds and firing a five ounce shot. The categories of size were named after birds of prey or fabulous beasts. There was the Basilisk 8.75 inch cannon, the Culverin 4.5 to 5.5 inch caliber, the Seca, the Minion, the Falcon and the Falconet at two inches. There was a long list of other types and variants within each grouping and subgroups often called bastards. There were slings, murderers, flankers, shrimps, orgs, aspics and sparrows. Henry VIII embarked on a massive purchase of cannon. He also began to arm his ships. The cargo decks had holes cut in the sides to allow for firing a cannon broadside. Soon an arms race ensued on the open seas. Bigger ships or galleons were constructed to hold even more cannon. By the 1580s, galleons in the thousand ton range had put to sea. These were the ships of Drake and Hawkins. The naval cannon was designed for rapid firing. Because they were muzzle loading, they utilized the recoil energy of the gun to push themselves back inside the ship. There they were reloaded and with the use of pulleys and chocks pulled back into firing position. Naval warfare changed dramatically. To rule the seas, a nation had to be able to build large blue water navies and equip them with cannon and experienced crews. Naval battles became an art more than a science, with both strategy and tactics playing crucial roles. Good seamanship, a strong nerve and a degree of intrepidity were also required, as wars were often won or lost in a single action. On the 8th of August 1588, the Grand Spanish Armada, consisting of 22 galleons and 108 armed merchant ships and supported by Rome, attempted to invade England. They reached the English Channel, where they were engaged by the English Armada, consisting of 34 warships and 163 armed merchant vessels. Commanded by Charles Howard, Francis Drake and Sir John Hawkins, they fought a series of battles and attacked with fire ships and effective cannon fire. The Spanish fled north around Scotland, but suffered heavy losses against the coast of Ireland. The rout effectively destroyed Spain's offensive sea power. The undeclared Anglo-Spanish War petered out in 1604. The Battle of Trafalgar was another example of effective tactics and use of cannon. On the 21st of October 1805, the British fleet under the command of Horatio Nelson engaged the combined French and Spanish fleets off the coast of Trafalgar, Spain. Nelson's fleet consisted of 27 ships of the line against Napoleon's 18 ships of the line and eight other warships plus the Spanish fleet of 15. Nelson's tactics had his fleet in two columns steer into the midsection of the enemy's line, breaking up their formation, disrupting their signal communications and attacking their ships piecemeal. The French had executed most of their experienced officers in the revolution and their gunners were poorly experienced. Nelson had seasoned officers and crews well trained in cannon and shot. Even outnumbered and outgunned, Nelson's fleet devastated the French and Spanish with losses of 21 ships captured, one sunk. A total of 3,243 casualties to England's 449 killed, including Horatio Nelson. This ensured the command of the oceans remained in British hands. On land, however, war was often less decisive, although there are several examples of artillery being the defining force. For example, the Battle of Panipat in 1526. 
This battle took place in northern India and marks the beginning of the Mughal Empire. A small force of Babur, the ruler of Kabul, numbering 15,000 men and 20 pieces of field artillery, moved against the much larger army of Ibrahim Lodi, the ruler of northern India. He fielded between 30 and 40,000 men and 100 war elephants, but no artillery. It was a decisive battle for many reasons, including the fact that the elephants were scared of the guns, panicked, and trampled their own soldiers. The effects of these cannon in sieges were apocalyptic, for they brought down the walls of any medieval fortification. It changed the concept of siege warfare. New types of building had to be developed to defend against cannon. Jean-Baptiste de Griboval of the 18th century helped standardize artillery design. He developed a 16-inch, 150mm field howitzer and made it the standard of the French army. This improved manufacture, maintenance and repair. At the time of the introduction of the flintlock to small arms, it too was utilized in cannon design and improved the ignition system. By 1789, the manufacture, deployment and use of field artillery was down to a fine art. Particularly by one ex-artillery officer in the French army, by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. From here, the technology of metallurgy, chemistry and design led to improvements in artillery. Breech loading was becoming feasible by the 1880s. The first truly modern cannon was deployed in 1897 by French forces, the Model 75. It was highly mobile and breech loading with cased ammunition, modern sights and a self-contained firing mechanism. Cannon was smooth bore, which restricted the weapon's range and accuracy. The machinery to accurately rifle a cannon barrel did not arrive until the 19th century. Cavelli, Warendorf and Whitworth all independently produced rifled cannon in the 1840s. But these guns did not see widespread use until the latter stages of the American Civil War, when designs such as the Rodman guns came to prominence. Two main uses of artillery were forming the small light howitzer cannon that remained with and were utilized for the support of infantry, and the much larger, heavier cannon that was used from some distance away for indirect and harassing fire. The improvement of communications was a key to this newer usage and the development of forward observation posts to help direct fire. During the American Civil War on July the 1st, 1862, General Lee launched an attack on Major General McClellan's forces positioned on Malvern Hill. The Confederates suffered 5,300 casualties and gained no ground whatsoever due to McClellan's use of artillery. McClellan then withdrew his forces to Harrison's Landing, where heavily armed gunboats protected them. The American Civil War was the last major conflict to employ Napoleonic tactics and methods of warfare. The introduction of new technology was turning armed conflict into something never seen before. The mechanization of weapons and increased firepower were obliterating the soldier on the field. New weapons required new tactics and new methodologies. Unfortunately, it would take two more conflicts and a great loss of life before these lessons were learned. The French Schneider 75mm quickfire cannon of 1897 was the precursor of most modern field artillery. Its dual hydraulic recoil system kept the carriage perfectly still during shots, negating the need to reseat or re-aim the gun, which could fire 20 to 30 rounds per minute. Known as the French 75, its official name was Matériel de 75 mm 1897. It was ahead of its time, and it took German and British gun designers years to catch up. The Russian 1902 Putilov field gun was developed for the conflict against Japan. It incorporated the latest in technology of the time. Chambered for 76.2mm ammunition, 
It had carriage recoil devices fitted with transverse and elevation tracking mechanisms and precision sighting capability. Referred to as the three-incher, it was well accepted into the military and proved a reliable divisional artillery piece. It survived several wars, including World War II, where modified versions were used by Soviet and other forces. The First World War saw a huge increase in the use of artillery. Once the mobile war drew to a halt and forces dug in, the trench war began, and immediately artillery seemed to come to the fore in dealing with this tactic. Most generals believe that an immense projection of force focused on a single point could push the lines back. The combination of artillery, mortar and the new forward observation capability of aircraft was to punch holes in the front lines, allowing the new tank and infantry to penetrate the breach. This required a lot of artillery. The Somme offensive by Allied forces along a 19-kilometer front from July to November 1916 is recorded as one of the bloodiest military operations ever undertaken and the largest battle of World War I. The attempt to break through German lines and draw forces away from the Battle of Verdun resulted in 1.5 million casualties, mainly from artillery and machine gun. The true horror of modern warfare had been revealed. The Battle of Vimy Ridge was a success for artillery. A Canadian Forces diversionary offensive against the German 6th Army along the Western Front, lasting four days, it utilized the creeping barrage and tactical innovation. The Canadians were able to rout the German forces. On the other hand, artillery usage could prove a failure. At the Battle of Passchendaele, also known as the Third Battle of Ypres, Commonwealth forces attacked German lines in an attempt to reach the coast and German U-boat bases. The majority of the battlefield was swampy, reclaimed marshland, and after artillery bombardment became an impassable sea of sticky mud which bogged down tanks and countless soldiers drowned. After three months of fighting, Passchendaele was taken and the battle ended on the 6th of November 1917. Allied forces lost 500,000 casualties, the Germans half that at 250,000. The ground captured from the offensive equated to two inches of ground for each soldier's life. The Zig 33, Schweres Infanteriegeschütz 33, was a German 150mm close support infantry gun adopted in 1933. It saw extensive service during World War II and was mounted on a panzer tank chassis for mobility. Also adopted the same year as part of their rearmament campaign was the German SHF-18 howitzer, a heavy field gun. To achieve greater range, bigger and more powerful cannon were built. Some so large they had to be moved by rail. The Leopold railway cannon was a 280 mm gun capable of firing a projectile weighing 550 pounds up to 11 miles. Its barrel was 70.8 feet long. The Moser Karl railway gun was another. The largest ever built and fired in anger was the German Schwerer Gustav 800 mm gun. The British deployed railway guns along their coast near Dover. They were 13.5 inch guns named Gladiator, Scene Shifter and Peacemaker. The Germans deployed 40-centimeter guns near Calais. By the time of the Second World War, some lessons had been learned. 
This war was lightning fast in comparison to the last. Mobility and overpowering firepower were the keys to success. Due to the variety of terrain that the war was fought over, new gun designs proliferated. The mountain gun for one. It was able to be disassembled and carried in pieces by either animal or human. Taken through rough mountainous or jungle terrain, it was then reassembled and put to use and as troop support was invaluable. At sea, the galleon had given way to the modern battleship and dreadnought. With massive guns, they were able to lay down barrage fire onto islands and atolls in support of marine landings. theater, several artillery pieces were effective. The M3 model was developed specifically for airborne forces and was able to be parachute dropped or delivered by glider. It was based on the M2 barrel 105mm howitzer and the carriage of the 75mm pack howitzer. Also developed during World War II was the US 155mm howitzer. It was a towed piece with a longer barrel and new breech mechanism to the older designs. It still fired a separate shell and propellant bag configuration. The Russian 76mm field gun was developed as an infantry support weapon and deployed in 1943. It could fire 10 to 12 rounds per minute and had a maximum range of 4.2 kilometers. Production of this weapon ceased at the end of the war. One instance of intense and extended use of artillery above the norm occurred at the Battle of Tali Iantala in 1944, a two-week battle during the Second World War between Finland, Germany and the Soviet Union in an attempt to push Finland out of the war. Utilizing artillery, tank and aircraft bombardment, the Soviets advanced on the Finnish positions. They retreated to secondary defenses with German artillery assistance, the Finnish forces held their ground, but were eventually pushed back to the third line of defense. Due to extensive use of artillery, the Soviets gained ground, but could not destroy the Finnish forces. So the art of artillery had matured. Modern communications allowed for quick-fire response to non-line-of-sight targets. Modern ammunition was accurate and effective. The use of artillery batteries was refined. A barrage could be defined by cyclic rate as light fire, being six to seven shells per minute, medium, 30 shells a minute, heavy, 50 to 60 shells a minute. Barrages could be of several types. Box barrage fired around a target to isolate it from reinforcement or around a friendly outpost to repel infantry attack. Pinpoint barrage aimed at specific targets like machine gun or sniper posts. Search barrage, utilizing forward observation or aerial posts to call fall of fire in search of enemy targets. Counter battery fire, targeted against enemy artillery. The lifting barrage, artillery fire concentrating on one target, then lifting to a second target further afield, allowing for infantry advance toward the first target. The standing barrage, static defensive fire to withhold territory from enemy forces. The creeping or walking barrage, artillery fire that would slowly move forward, allowing troops to follow behind. The Second World War differs from the first primarily due to mobility. Although barrage tactics were used often, they were never as large as those of the fixed trench warfare of the First World War. Artillery needed to move quickly to keep up with advancing armies. Self-propelled artillery emerged. As fast as a tank, but lightly armored, these were not front-line weapons. 
These artillery pieces could drive themselves to a firing position, set up, and deliver accurate artillery fire to forward forces in support of troops. There are many examples of these from both the German and American armies. The German Panzer II tank was undergunned and underarmored and was withdrawn from frontline service early in 1940. Its chassis was reworked and a Howitzer 105mm was added to become a self-propelled artillery piece, the SDKFZ-124 Vespe. The Sturm Tiger, built on the Panzer VI Tiger chassis, was armed with a large naval mortar and was enlisted to demolish heavily defended buildings and fortified areas. Only 18 were ever built. The Americans followed suit with models like the M7 Priest 105mm howitzer employed by the British during the war. There was also the M8 HMC 75mm mobile artillery based on the Stuart light tank. The Marines also found use for self-propelled artillery. The 75mm howitzer version of their LVT-A4, which fought with the 5th Marine Division, 2nd Armoured Amphibious Battalion at Iwo Jima in 1945. Other technology was also creeping into the field of artillery, the rocket. The T-34 Calliope rocket launcher, based on a tank chassis, was called the Screaming Mimi, after the noise made by the rocket's firing. The HMC M37 was another self-propelled 105mm howitzer, based on a lengthened chassis of the M24 Chaffee light tank. Beginning in the First World War, but perfected during the Second, was a branch of the artillery family developed for a new threat. Their target? Aircraft. The anti-aircraft cannon used air-bursting munitions, often called flak, to hit aircraft, either in close-quarter infantry defense or in the protection of cities or military bases from massed bombers. After the First World War, aircraft technology developed rapidly. Planes could fly higher and faster than ever before. Many considered anti-aircraft fire impractical in reaching the altitudes and volume of fire to be effective. In the interwar years, the German Krupp company, in association with Bofors, designed a cannon that had a high muzzle velocity and high rate of fire the German 88 Flak was created. Flak is a German contraction of Flugzeugabwehrkanone. It was produced in large numbers and was highly mobile, even being fired whilst on the move. It also doubled as a very effective anti-tank weapon. There were several variants developed in other calibers. At sea, with the rise to power of the aircraft carrier and the ability to project air power over wide areas of ocean, battle groups needed anti-aircraft protection and numerous anti-aircraft guns were deployed. Their ability to shoot down enemy aircraft was quickly realized as an essential element to any naval vessel's survival. The great aircraft carrier battles of World War II in the Pacific are a case in point. On the 20th century battlefield, and with the rise of mechanized infantry and tank forces, artillery was again modified to take on the tank. And it was found that many anti-aircraft guns could double as anti-tank weapons.
With two battlefronts to contend with, the Germans needed more effective anti-tank weapons, particularly with the appearance of the Soviet tank forces in large numbers. One quick fix was the Marden II design. It was based on the obsolete Panther chassis and armed with either captured Soviet 76.2mm field guns or their own Pac-40 cannon. The German Jagdpanther was the very best tank destroyer. The SDKFZ-173 was based on a widened Panther chassis housing an 88mm Pac-43 gun. With a low profile, it was easily camouflaged. Its cannon could penetrate any Allied tank, effectively destroying them. 392 were produced beginning in 1944 and most served on the Eastern Front. The Jagd Tiger, based on the battle-proven Tiger chassis, was armed with the Pac-44 L55 gun. It was the most powerful anti-tank weapon utilized during the war, capable of engaging targets well beyond their fire range. Its maximum range was over 22,000 meters, and it was able to penetrate any Allied armor. One drawback for this weapon was speed and range. It consumed five liters of fuel per kilometer of road traveled. They were best used in camouflaged static positions to make full use of their armament. Once again, they were matched by American industrial might, developing their own range of tank killers. The M18 Hellcat, built by Buick, was the fastest tracked vehicle of the war, with a top speed of 56 miles per hour. The M18 was one of the best armored designs. It was designed from the ground up to be a tank killer, armed with a 37 mm cannon, which was replaced with the much more powerful 57 mm cannon. The US also produced this half-track M3 model, armed with a 75mm M1A1 pack howitzer. The M10 GMC, or gun motor carriage, nicknamed TDs by US forces for tank destroyers, was designated Wolverine by the British. It carried a three-inch cannon. The Russians relied on the Zis-3 gun as their main anti-tank weapon. The 76mm gun was introduced in 1942. A very successful weapon, it has survived in various forms till today. The conventional use of artillery continued on from World War II. During the Korean War, at the Battle of Pork Chop Hill, UN forces employed predefined box barrages to protect their outposts. And in the Vietnam War, a walking barrage was used in the defense of the infamous U.S. Khe Sanh base. In March, about the time of the 14th anniversary of his victory at the NBN Phu, Giap orders the withdrawal of the first of two divisions which are then in the process of being destroyed. British forces used a walking barrage in the Falkland Islands campaign in 1982 in support of the 42 Commando advance on Mount Harriet. With the advance of technology, many aspects of artillery function have been supplanted by missiles and rockets. 
However, there is still a place for artillery, both as indirect fire and infantry support. The United States has developed a novel use of artillery with the speed and the maneuverability for modern armies. Cannon have been fitted to C-130 gunships with computer-controlled fire systems, a devastating and accurate weapon which can be called upon at a moment's notice. 40,000 men were landed behind the enemy's lines in an operation executed without a hitch. Seemingly, the war had reached a turning point as the fresh troops started an encircling move of the North Koreans. Artillery technology continued to improve in minor degrees during the 50s and 60s. Introduced during the Vietnam War was the model 102-105 mm howitzer. Another light howitzer, it can be transported by parachute or helicopter, and it saw service in the first Gulf War. It has been retired from main military service and was replaced by the M119 artillery piece. The M102 is still used in the AC-130 gunship. The M110A2 203mm howitzer is a heavy artillery piece and the largest ever fielded by the United States. Its lineage can be dated back to the British 203mm cannon of World War I vintage. It is still in use with some NATO countries. The M109A6 Paladin is the current United States self-propelled 155mm howitzer. In use in several countries, this model is now being replaced with either the AS-90 or German PZH-2000. Each of these howitzers has a high rate of fire, up to three rounds in nine seconds. With computer-controlled targeting and smart munitions, it will remain a lethal part of most armies. New systems are being designed, like the American AGDSM-1. An experimental, high-protected, low-altitude, self-propelled air defense gun missile system. The British have incorporated the MLRSM-270 rocket system into their artillery battery, which saw service in the Gulf conflicts. Artillery on the modern battlefield is certain to remain a dominant power, both with direct infantry support and indirect fire. The trend towards low profile, even radar deflecting designs will continue, along with computerized target acquisition tied into a worldwide satellite and communication system combined with smart munitions capable of seeking out camouflage targets. Modern ammunition comes in all shapes and sizes, from basic high explosive to anti-tank and ground penetrating shaped explosives and rocket assisted warheads. It also includes base ejection systems for bomblets, scatterable mines, flares, smoke, incendiary, and anti-radar chaff. Newer forms of munitions include the copperhead. A thin stabilized, laser-guided, self-maneuvering warhead capable of delivering a shaped charge to any hardened target, like a tank, from between 2 and 16 kilometers.
The only drawback is cloud cover obscuring the target. The MX982 Excalibur round, now in limited deployment, will, once fired from a howitzer cannon, be able to glide to a target up to 40 to 57 kilometers away and, utilizing global GPS satellites, to lock into a target with a circular error probability of less than 5 meters. Other smart munitions can ride a laser beam from a designated position by a forward observer, either human or robotic, to its target with pinpoint accuracy. The cannon will remain a mainstay of machines of war for many years to come.